Chapter 1. The Man, the Castle and the Question. Wednesday, June the 12th, 1191. Norman Westerville was not a brave man, nor a particularly kind man, but he was cleverer than most. The one thing Norman had always been able to do was make the smart choices when it came to his own survival. So why was he now in a castle, spear in hand, heart in throat, shoulder to shoulder with half a dozen other men all shaking in their chain mail? This was meant to be the safe place. When the first whisper of plague had crept into his small village of Eastcombe, he hadn't wasted any time. He'd left his mother, brothers and sisters without farewells and was out on the road that same afternoon. Norman had made the right call, as now the population of Eastcombe consisted only of a hermit and a dog. Norman felt sorry for his family, of course, but slightly smug that he was now the last surviving Westerville. When the king had come looking for able-bodied men to join his quest to the Holy Land, Norman had hid. He'd stayed in the inn's privy until the kingsman left with three younger, more impressionable boys in tow. The idea of a desert full of swords didn't seem like an adventure to Norman. He'd never liked sand. He'd once been to the coast and left thoroughly unimpressed. And the fact that the king's return was subsequently delayed over and over let Norman know he had once again made the right call. When the crime wave had begun in the city outskirts and the surrounding forest, Norman had left the bakery where he'd worked those last two months and applied for the job of castle guard. An impending royal visit meant the powers that be had been looking to beef up their security, and Norman calculated that a job inside the city fortress would be safer than one out of it. After all, who would be mad enough to try and break into the castle, especially when everyone was going to be on such high alert? And guards got three square meals a day. People would be baking him bread. The choice had seemed clear. But now, both Norman's present and his future seemed murky at best. The night had started peacefully enough. Back on his bunk, Having finished his shift guarding the prisoner from London, who never caused any trouble, he'd just pulled off his boots when the commotion began. Fire! came the cry from outside the barracks. Norman jumped from his bunk, reluctantly pulled his boots back on and hurried out of the door into the warm summer night. Sure enough, smoke and flames were billowing out of the South Tower. Probably some noble had been reading in bed again. Realising that there was no immediate danger to himself, he decided to use the distraction to make his way down to the kitchens. Ever since the royal procession had arrived, the quality of leftovers had much improved. He was digging into a serviceable piece of poultry pie when he heard the alarm. But this was not an alarm for the fire, no, this was something else. It took Norman more than a moment to remember his training. In his defence, this had only consisted of Reginald, the castle's master-at-arms, throwing the recruits some mail and spears and then waffling on about royal protocol. But Norman's ears had pricked up when Reginald went through the castle's alert protocols. Norman always paid attention when staying alive was the order of the day. Right, men! Reginald had barked, his long salt-and-pepper beard hiding a chin engorged by years of sedentary ordering rather than actual combat. You're only likely to hear three alerts that pertain to your duties while you're stationed here. Bell, Horn, and lastly, Bell and Horn. Bell means we're getting a visitor and you must present arms at your station. Horn, enemy at the gates, siege positions. Bell and Horn, hostile breach at the walls. Now, as he continued to dispose of his pie, those words rang clearly through Norman's brain. He listened. The bell. Then a long, loud blast of the horn. A breach? A bloody breach? Why would they signal a breach before a siege? How had the hostiles got in without anyone noticing? It doesn't matter, Norman thought to himself, steadying his nerves. 
He'd had his exit route planned for a while now, just in case. There was an uncommonly wide murder hole on the back left turret. Not wide enough for a big man, or even a regular-sized man, but Norman, despite his healthy appetite, had always been remarkably lithe. He'd measured it the week before last when the siege horn had blown. A snug fit, but a fit nonetheless. Some locals had amassed at the gates, complaining of food shortages. It wasn't too serious, though. The sheriff distributed some loaves from the castle kitchens, and the crowd had quickly dispersed. But tonight, this was a breach, and no amount of sourdough was going to help. Thinking quickly, Norman grabbed an empty hessian bag and began filling it with supplies for the road. Cheese, salt beef, more cheese and prepared to make his way to the wider-than-regulation murder hole. He was only two turns away when... Westerville! Where the bloody hell do you think you're going? Norman turned to face Reginald. The old soldier was fully armoured, and his sword was drawn. Er, uh, to position, sir? Norman lied quickly. With a sack! Reginald scanned Norman suspiciously, as if he could smell the cowardice as well as the cheese. Provisions, sir? I thought the men might get hungry, if it's a long siege. Drop your sack. Get your spear. He's inside. He's heading towards the prince. It was only now Norman realised that behind all the bluster, Reginald was clearly terrified. He? Norman repeated. Who was he? Where is your spear, Westerville? It's back at the barracks, sir. I thought it was just a fire. That way should be safe now, boy. Come on! Reginald grabbed him by the scruff of his tunic and led him forcefully back outside. The wooden walkway lining the wall linked the barracks to the rest of the castle, giving Norman a good view of the courtyard down below. It was illuminated in a faint orange glow. The fire from the south tower was clearly still burning. Yet he heard them before he saw them. The moans of injured men... The first figure he saw was pressed up against an empty wooden rack, one which usually held spears and pikes. Norman peered through the gloom and saw the man spasm, his arms stretched out, almost Christ-like. Then Norman noticed the arrows, one through the palm of each hand, pinning him to the wood behind. The man wasn't having a fit. He was trying to pull himself free. Norman's eyes moved quickly away from this grotesque sight, trying to find the source of the other groans echoing below him. One by one he saw them, each immobilised, white fletching protruding from a leg, a shoulder, the ribs, but no corpses. Every one that Norman could see was still alive. Quit dawdling, Westerville, barked Reginald. The longer you look, the more yellow you'll get. Norman entered the barracks, begrudgingly dropped his sack and picked up his spear. Re-entering the castle with Reginald snapping at his heels, he heard it for the first time, the first time in his life, the sound he'd been trying to avoid ever since his brother had told him the legend of King Arthur. It was the sound of battle. Screams, swords, and then the thunk of an arrow hitting flesh. Norman felt quite ill. The sounds were coming from the ground floor just below them, and for one heart-stopping moment it seemed as if that was the direction Reginald had in mind. But by some merciful grace of heaven that Norman wasn't sure he deserved, Reginald led him up a spiral staircase away from the battle. As the sounds of the fighting faded, he heard new voices up ahead, and as they turned the corner, Norman saw a group of men. He recognised a few faces. They were in the same mail as him, holding the same spears. One, Norman noted with considerable envy, had a crossbow. Yet, no matter how they were armed, each man wore an almost identical expression, as if to ask... What the hell has just entered Nottingham Castle? Reginald pushed his way through the group of frightened men and knocked on the door they were guarding. It opened inward a crack, 
allowing Norman a glimpse of a gaunt cheek, a wide blue eye, and the gleam of a crown slightly too big for the head on which it rested. Is it over? the prince asked, hopefully. No, your highness, Reginald murmured so quietly Norman could barely hear him. The prince opened the door a little wider, surveying the men of his last guard. He seemed to be counting them. Norman was sure that he and the six others didn't inspire much confidence. As if to confirm his suspicion, the prince, looking pale with worry, began to close the door again. Norman felt it before he saw it. A little ripple in the air. His straw thatch of a fringe ruffled slightly. Norman turned instinctively to follow it, but in the time it took to turn his head, two more ripples shot by. The three arrows were buried deep into the wood of the door. They'd been launched with such force they'd pushed it wide open, nailing it to the wall behind. The prince's nose was bleeding profusely, cracked by the violent swing of the door. He was holding his head back and whimpering. It was almost comical. But only one person was smiling in that corridor. A man holding a long bow and wearing a hood. The hooded man was panting slightly at the far end of the corridor, blood trickling from the corner of his swollen, grinning lip. Though only the bottom half of his face was visible, Norman could see that the man's complexion was dark. He'd never seen a moor, but he guessed that this was what he was looking at. The man's hood was the deep red of wine, his tunic a mottled greeny-brown, some patches darker than others. The man's quiver was almost full. Enough arrows for everyone. The bow hung lazily at his side. The hooded man's voice was quiet, but no one missed a word. <laughs> Where is my wife? The sound of the man's voice seemed to stir something. Norman felt the men around him shuffle. He heard the twist of leather from the grip of a spear, the soft chink of mail as the man next to him shifted his weight. The lucky bastard with the crossbow raised it tentatively. What's the plan here, gentlemen? Don't you have wives or children? Someone you'd like pressed up against you? Someone who cares for you and wants you to come home whole? The hooded man reached into a pouch that hung from his belt. Still smiling, he flung something towards them. It landed with a grim, wet thud. A hand. Norman had never seen just a hand. He'd known enough thieves to have seen stumps, but never just a hand. Unattached. There's no shame to be had in surrender tonight, the hooded man continued. His tone surprised Norman. It wasn't gloating or threatening, but one of a victorious knight congratulating his opponent on a battle well fought. The hooded man stepped forward, hands outstretched. I've been at this a lot longer than any of you. Please, go home. The guard with the crossbow looked to Reginald. What was he hoping for? Orders? Reginald still held his sword drawn, but seemed too stunned to lift it. Norman, as always, started calculating the odds of survival. He considered the hooded man's words. If he was truly going to let him pass, Norman could be at his murder hole in less than two minutes. But what if the guards won? After all, there were six of them. The odds were in their favour, and if they beat the hooded man and caught up to Norman, well, he'd be hanged as a deserter. The hooded man let out a little sigh. His left hand reached behind him slowly, grasping the white fletching of an arrow. Do you know why I'm so good with this bow? He asked, fixing the arrow to the string. Norman was sure he didn't expect an answer. Because I have been using it nearly all my life. And my life has been a long one. The hooded man raised his head as he drew the arrow back. Norman could finally get a proper look at the man's face. 
if his life had been long, he had aged remarkably well. Aside from his bleeding lip, his skin was unblemished, his face unlined, and he seemed to still have all his teeth. But his eyes... His eyes held a veteran's stare. They were almost grey, like a cloud holding on to too much rain. Though the man was smiling, tired was the word that entered Norman's mind. Some of you may think you know who I am, but I assure you, my tale started long before Nottingham. I've stormed the walls of Apollo City. I am the sole witness to the Battle of the Hot Gates. I have been strung up by Democrats, impaled by tyrants. Yet here I stand. I'll ask you one more time. What is your plan? Norman dropped his spear. There was a loud clatter as it hit the floor. The other guardsmen looked at him. Reginald opened his mouth as if to reprimand him, but no words came out. The hooded man lowered his bow. Norman, feeling rather foolish, raised his hand. Um, excuse me, sire. I'd like to go, please. That's my plan, if you'll allow it. What's your name? Norman, sire. Norman Westerville. He was surprised by his own honesty. All right, Norman. You get to live another day. The hooded man gestured past him towards the stairs, all the while holding Norman's gaze. Off you go. Norman began walking towards the hooded man, the stairs and freedom, not even glancing back at his fellow guardsmen. But after a few steps, he heard a clang. Another spear hit the floor. Then another. And another. As he passed the hooded man, he noticed the darker patches of the man's tunic were not dye, but blood. His own blood, with holes and rips marking each wet spot. Norman, who was not a naturally curious man, found himself burning with questions. What was this man? What did he want? And, more importantly, how had he survived? But he was too prudent for delay. Opting instead to suppress his newfound curiosity, he walked briskly down the stairs. He was followed by every single man who, up until a few moments ago, had stood guarding the acting monarch of England. Adam watched them go, before pulling off his hood. It had been a long night, in a long month, in a long life. But he was glad he'd managed to avoid killing, or even injuring any more tonight. He'd never liked killing, even if he'd learned to be good at it. And he'd had to learn. For this. All for this. Maybe this would be the last time. Maybe this would be the end of his search. Adam looked at the prince. He hadn't moved, hadn't even attempted to grab a defence from the litter of discarded weapons before him. Who are you? Really? the prince asked, his voice quivering. Your Highness, I am but a man, albeit a strange one. I have lived day after day since the beginning, so I have learnt much and travelled far all in service of answering one question. Adam raised his bow, his arms aching from the long night's work. Where is my wife?